Thank you again for taking time to talk with us, Dr. Thompson. It's great to have you here. If you don't mind, for our audience's sake, just briefly introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your work and background. Sure. I'm uh, Paul Thompson. I'm the W.K. Kellogg Chair in Agricultural Food and Community Ethics at Michigan State University. I'm trained in philosophy and uh, have had a long-standing interest in the environmental impact of emerging technologies. Uh, I've actually spent my entire career for around 35 years now working on um, technology in the context of food and agriculture. So I've done everything from GMOs to animal welfare to sustainability. Hmm. So um, you're visiting with us today as part of our Rock Research Ethics Lecture Series. And the sort of topic that we're asking you to discuss with us today around genetically modified organisms it's sort of at the fringe of traditional research ethics topics. Uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit about which, what sort of ethical issues you see as particularly relevant in this research ethics arena. Well, I think one of the um, uh, important areas in research ethics is that uh, we live in a, a, a society that's uh, uh, technologically rich and uh, none of us really understand uh, a lot of the technologies that we use and that saturate our environment. So this implies to me a responsibility on behalf of scientists and particularly scientists at public institutions to uh, uh, be liaisons and honest brokers with respect to some of these technologies. Uh, this is not something that has really been thought of as a key issue in, in research ethics, at least as it's become associated with compliance, uh, you know, um, living up to human subjects per sec uh, uh, requirements and living up to uh, uh, protection of, uh, of uh, um, research integrity type questions. So uh, I think uh, it's actually an, an understudied and underemphasized uh, area in research ethics and, and GMOs are a great case study in that. Um, relatedly, um, are any of the ethical issues in research ethics novel in the context of genetically modified organisms, or is it just a new, an application to a relatively novel emerging technology? Well, I think that um, in all areas of emerging technology, uh, the questions are going to become specific based on what the technology is, what it does, which kind of stakeholders it affects, uh, how well it's understood by users, how important users think it is that they do understand it, uh, and I think that uh, really for all of those questions, there are ways in which uh, GMOs uh, differ from some other areas in which we're getting uh, new technologies. I mean, probably the most important impactful emerging technology has been information technology, yet people seem to be relatively comfortable with, uh, you know, adopting smartphones and computers and whatever the next generation is. Uh, they've proven to be much less comfortable with uh, some of these emerging food technologies. Mm. So because of that um, uncomfortability as it's linked to something like living systems, whether those are crops or animals, are there specific crops or animal species that are of particular ethical concern? Well, I think I would uh, steer the, uh, the uh, question away from the species, although I do think that animals raise a whole set of questions that plants don't raise, maybe, obviously. But um, uh, it, it's really much more the nature of the modification, the particular functional uh, trait uh, that the modification is, is intended to uh, introduce. Uh, so I actually think that uh, if you talk about uh, uh, herbicide resistance or um, BT crops that uh, are effective against uh, certain species of insects, uh, many of the issues would be similar in corn or cotton. Um, obviously, we don't eat cotton. Uh, but uh, it, it really is much more tied to the specific modification than it is to the species That's into species. which it's introduced. Hmm. Okay. So there's a, a certain level of technical skill, technical manipulation that goes into this, to any issue around genetic modification. Are there specific uh, scientific tools or techniques that are directly relevant to, or directly important to genetic modification? Well, yes, um, and uh, I, in many respects I think the most fundamental technology is one that's, that hasn't been controversial at all. It's uh, uh, just uh, ordinary tissue culture, which is the technique that uh, plant scientists use to regenerate an entire plant uh, from a single cell. I think that uh, 
is really what made, the, it was in certain respects the breakthrough technology more than actual genetic modification itself that made this a practical approach in terms of plant development. Mm. Um, but uh, we've seen a whole wave of new technologies uh, coming along, uh, along the lines in terms of plant modification and uh, we're now able to uh, be much more precise in terms of where the genes are going. Uh, we have... Uh, As opposed to the shotgun approach right, that we discussed. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I think those things are changing the landscape of discussion and debate. Um, but um, uh, so it, it in, in, in many respects is a, large, uh, uh, is a large landscape of specific tools. Um, but I think in many respects uh, people can, uh, can get a handle on uh, talking about some of the key issues uh, simply by understanding that uh, uh, changing the genetic makeup of a plant or an animal is possible. To some extent it's possible even without the tools of genetic engineering. Uh, and that uh, uh, when we can tie this to something that's functionally important in terms of how you raise the, the plant or animal or the kind of uses that you put the plant or animal, uh, then uh, we get new possibilities in agriculture. Hmm. Great, great. So a lot of your work for a long time now has been in agricultural and food ethics specifically, and it places you at a really interesting intersection between industry and science and policy and ethics. Um, we're specifically interested, we have been for a while now, on the impact of ethics and science work for graduate students. Mm -hmm. And specifically, I'm interested to hear you say a little bit about the role you see developing young professionals, whether those are graduate students or young faculty, and their relationship and orientation to policy-related issues. Right. Well, I think our training for, um, uh, in the sciences generally, and uh, I think this has been true in agricultural science. Agricultural science has historically uh, trained people to be able to talk to farmers. Uh, and to be able to interact with uh, uh, industry, uh, but uh, maybe not so much uh, to be able to uh, interact with uh, the broader public, be able to uh, work with uh, uh, public interest groups, non-governmental organizations, uh, and to see themselves as having uh, this uh, kind of liaison officer responsibility that I was describing earlier. So I think this is a really uh, critical need. I'm, I wouldn't say that Every working scientist has to do this, but uh, uh, there's a really critical need for uh, this be coming to be seen as something that it's important for uh, people in the agricultural sciences to do, and that at least at an institutional level, uh, to be sure that uh, people are uh, more attentive to the concerns and questions uh, that uh, people from broader walks of life might have. That does put young researchers especially in genetic modification issues, in interesting positions as liaisons. So on the one hand, they've got to be responsive to um, public opinions and public uh, emotions, affect, around issues of food. But there's also this broader range of environmental issues in genetic modification. Um, what do you see as potential future ethical issues in genetic modification as it relates to the environment? Well, there's certainly uh, um, a, a set of issues which I think are well appreciated within the uh, uh, biotech community as you start to uh, think about non-food uh, uses for agricultural crops. Uh, and uh, the, uh, an extreme example would be producing drugs in a plant. Uh, and I think there's a, a, an appreciation that uh, uh, there are kind of obvious public health and environmental risks that would be associated uh, with that. I think even as you move towards uh, uh, biofuels which might be compatible with uh, a food use, uh, there, be, there get to be really uh, difficult questions, uh, not only about things that go into the food supply chain, but how these alternative uses affect uh, the total food production system, mm. uh, whether they uh, bias production away from foods, um, and uh, although I don't think there are clear-cut answers to whether that's always a good or bad thing, I think those become some of uh, the crucial questions. Uh, it's always been a question uh, as to whether or not um, you really, you know, in, in some respects the worst thing that you can do to an environment is to plow it up and use it for agriculture, right? So when you have a technology that um, uh, allows for areas that uh, haven't previously been cultivated uh, to become cultivated or to be cultivated in a new crop, uh, there are a whole set of environmental uh, issues that uh, 
need to be addressed, historically have not been addressed particularly well, uh, and uh, certainly uh, GMOs are a, a part of that mix. Okay, well, that makes sense. Um, we've asked all our guests in this lecture series if they could uh, offer a bit of advice to young graduate students, especially incoming graduate students. So if you could offer one piece of advice to graduate students, specifically as it relates to um, the role of ethics in science, what might that be? Well, I, I would encourage uh, uh, grad students to, um, uh, you know, there is one sense in which they, they clearly have to follow uh, the dictates of their training and their traditional past, path, uh, but most grad students who enter programs have some sort of relatively idealistic commitments. They want to do this. This has always been true in the agricultural sciences, uh, that uh, their interest in in this field is uh, because they think that they're going to be able to do good things, mm -hmm. right? Sure. So keep that commitment, hang on to it, but also nurture it by thinking more critically about it. Um, you know, finding ways, finding uh, writings, finding literatures, finding outlets, even if it's you're just writing a blog, uh, where you get a chance to try out some of your ideas about that and uh, find ways to interact with other scientists and with members of the public. Uh, to engage on some of these issues that probably motivated you from the very beginning. I like that idea very much of holding on to the motivation that led you to the discipline in the first place. That's great. Dr. Thompson, thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure. My, my, my pleasure. Thank you.